and they can say, but I don't understand. And I want to get this really clear, because if you don't understand something that's severely important, eternally important, uh, shame on us if we never uh, introduced and explained it carefully. Uh, you know, we hear about Jesus, we hear about the cross and religion and all that stuff, and he died and he rose and getting saved and, you know, what does it all mean? What's, what's, I don't get it. I believe in Jesus, so it's good, right? Uh, you know, I believe in God, so it's good. Well, tonight it is my desire to explain to you guys in the best way that I can through using something that maybe we face every day to really explain what was actually done. You might have heard me uh, say this before. I use it a lot in my evangelism, in my office, leading people to Christ. But I do want to start off with the scripture. Uh, Isaiah 48, 17. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord, your God, which teaches you to profit, which leads you by the way that you should go. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived deceived by the ear neither has the eye seen O God besides you what he has prepared for him that waits for him and that's Isaiah 64 4 so people might say okay so you got this Jesus I get it why do I need him for well maybe if I'm an alcoholic or a drug addict that's good for me maybe if I got a lot of problems that's good for me and sometimes people will say I'm glad that Jesus is working for you Okay, you use Jesus, I use Buddha, I use, you know, Tums, uh, whatever you use to get you through your day. And if it works, it is an expedient God. Uh, if he works for you, you use it. Uh, but the problem is, it's not that God is just good for some people. God is necessary for some people. If you had to walk on the sun up in the sky that we can, and God refers to himself, when you look at him in his glory, it's like looking at the sun in its full brightness. You can't even look at it, okay? Uh, if you wanted to go visit the sun as humans, it is impossible. You cannot go land on the sun. You couldn't even get, it's probably too hot right now for me. And we're not even near the sun. The sun being a star. Did you notice that? The sun is a star. We forget that, it's a star to rule the day and it reflects off the moon to rule the night okay see the problem is it's not that jesus is good to get you from a to b or through this rough spot in your life no jesus is necessary to exist all of us we are eternal beings we will live forever atheist agnostic buddhist satanist no matter what you are. And what do they say? Location, location, location. Where will you spend that etern eternity? There's only two places. And there's only one thing that's going to get you the ticket to that one place. It has nothing to do with being good, doing good things. It has nothing to do with showing some signs and supernatural manifestations. Nothing. Matter of fact, there is nothing that you and I can do to earn what God has waiting for us. And that's why God has stepped in with a solution. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through the Son. Jesus is, and I, you might have heard me say this, I'm a big uh, superhero fan. Jesus is our Iron Man suit. Now, if you ever watch, you know, the Avengers Iron Man is the one guy, he's really not a superhero. He just got a suit. When he's not in that suit, he really can't do anything. But isn't it interesting, the Bible says when we put on Christ, we're able to do what we couldn't do. Iron Man, when he puts on his Iron Man suit, and it's interesting, the suit puts on him, it kind of goes shh, 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 and he can fly and he can go and approach something he couldn't in his human form. When you put on Christ by choice, you get the righteousness of Christ on you to make you good enough to stay.
stand in God's presence. But that's not where we want to go tonight. What I want to do is really make this simple. Uh, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but if you've ever been in court, anybody, I've been in court, okay? I've been in court, I've had to approach the bench and explain things. And this is what I want you to remember. I'm going to use a real life scenario to explain a supernatural scenario. So once and for all, you understand what salvation is, what it really is, and why it's not just a good idea. It is mandatory for human existence. And there's nothing you can do to gain it but by receiving it. So I'm going to give you a scenario. We have a criminal court. Up at the front of that court, we have the judge in his royal robe. And there's a man standing in front of the court. On his left side is prosecuting attorney for the state. On his right side is your defense attorney. If you do not have one, one will be appointed to you. Right, you've heard that. Do you know God has appointed to you a defense attorney, if you want to use him? Anyway, this man, he has been caught committing a crime that in the state he lives in, the penalty for it is death by lethal injection. And the judge asks the man, he goes, so how do you plead? We got videotapes, we see you doing this crime. There's no way he's getting out of it. He's got like 20 witnesses. Judge says, how do you plead? The man says, I'm guilty, Your Honor. I'm guilty, there's nothing I can do. And the judge says, you realize by that admission, okay, you are going to have to go to the gas chamber and die by lethal injection or whatever chamber they call that. And he says, yes, I understand that. He's standing there with his orange jumpsuit, shackled by the feet, shackled by the hands. Doesn't look very well. Then his defense attorney stands up and says, Your Honor, may I approach the bench? And the judge says, You may approach. And he goes to the bench, he mentions a couple of things. The judge shakes his hand, sits back down. The judge says, Let's just call this guy. Let's let's call Bob. Let's 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 call him Bob, the guy who's who's in jail, who's going to go to the chair. So the defense attorney for Bob says something to the to the judge, and the judge repeats what he what he heard. So the judge says, Bob's attorney told me something that changes everything. Something uh, I did not take into account. And it seems that Bob's attorney knows that Bob is guilty. He knows it. But though he's been spending so much time with Bob during this case, he's grown quite fond of him. And he says, you know, Honor, I know he's guilty and deserves the, cr the payment for the crime he committed. But I really love this guy in a non-sexual way. I really love this man. And if, would, if the court would approve, I would like to go to the chair for Bob and take what his punishment is. In return, Bob would be forgiven for the crime and his record wiped clean and set free, never to be brought back into the court again. And the judge thinks upon this and says, Bob, what do you think? And he says, that's, what? that's crazy. You mean, Bob, I mean, my, my lawyer, you're going to die for me? Yes, that's what it takes. Just then, to the left of Bob is the prosecuting attorney, usually appointed by the state. And the prosecuting attorney says, Your Honor, hold on. I've been prosecuting cases for 35 years. I have never heard of such a ridiculous concept. You are actually considering letting his lawyer, an innocent man, go to the chair for a crime he didn't commit? And to that, the judge says, you sit down. I am the judge. I decide 
and there's something you don't know. No one knows here. Bob's lawyer happens to be my son, also. And I love my son. And I'm going to up the ante. I tell you this, if Bob decides to accept this freedom, I will not only let him go free, but I want something. If I'm losing a son, I want to adopt one. And Bob will be adopted into my family to bear all the beautiful things that go to being, hey, if you got a father who's a judge, it's pretty cool. You know, you get out of a lot of stuff. He is going to be adopted into my family and he is going to inherit everything I possess and he will be like a son unto me. And all Bob has to do is say yes or no. So the judge goes, Bob, what do you want to do? And, and Bob is just flabbergasted. He's flabbergasted. He goes, I, I can't comprehend this. You, I don't understand. What do I have to do? He goes, just accept what's being offered to you. And he goes, looks to his lawyer. He says, you're going to do this for me? He goes, yes. Your Honor, you're going to adopt me? And I'm going to be like a son unto you? He goes, yes. What are you going to do, Bob? And Bob says, well, he'd be a fool. And he goes, Bob, he goes, Your Honor, I accept. I, what else can I say? And the judge says, Bob, taking in all that was just laid out in front of you, there's only one thing I want from you. Do you know what it is? Bob says, yes, Your Honor, I think I do. What is it? Thankfulness. Thankfulness for what you have been given that you don't deserve. And they took off Bob's lawyer in shackles, took Bob out of his orange jumpsuit, dressed him in a nice suit and tie, and he came. And the judge, because you come up here to this bench, going to give you a big hug. And the court stands in awe. The world stands in awe of this, because you know where I'm going to go with this, people. We're going to replace these characters. We're going to replace the judge, and you know who he is. He's God the Father. And we're going to replace Bob's defense attorney. Who's your defense attorney who makes intercession for the saints both day and night? Jesus Christ. And who is your prosecuting attorney who wants you dead, 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 in jail for the rest of your life? Who is it? Satan. And that's the argument that Satan has with God all the time. And what is, if you're a child of God, what does God say to him? Covered. It's covered by the blood of my son. Yeah, but did you see what he's doing? Covered by the blood of my son. Do you see what he's gonna do? It's covered by the blood of my son. I adopted him, he's my son. No one can take him out of that position. And all Bob has to do, and, all, and who's Bob? He's a representing, representative of us. He represents humanity. It has nothing to do with religion. Bob doesn't have to go and, you know, and help a hundred old ladies across the street. He doesn't have to feed the poor. He's going to want to. You know what Bob's going to want to do? Who's he going to want to tell people about himself? He's going to want to tell them about his Savior, who gave up himself for him. Because let me tell you about this judge. Let me tell you about my lawyer. People, that is what the world does not understand. Okay? Jesus is not just a good idea for alcoholics and drug addicts. It is mandatory necessity to enter into God's kingdom. It's like a big ship that's sailing, and you better have a ticket on that ship. And you can't buy it. You can't earn it. You can't do anything for it. I don't care who you are. Because what does the Bible say? God has a book, the book of life, the Lamb's book of life, and whose names, whose ever names were not found written in that book, okay, are cast into the lake of fire. Not by God's choice. God's, you know God sends no one to hell. 
Even people say, oh, he's so mean. He says, how can he do it? No, he doesn't. We do. Because God says, I'm asking all of you right now, what are you going to do? Free gift of salvation? People, what fools we are to not accept that. And we think, well, but what do I got to do? Wear a tie? I got to go door to door, give out books? No. Accept it and be thankful. And live a life now that I have prepared for you. Because now if I'm your father, by adoption, it's the doctrine of adoption. Then I will teach you how to live in this life. And how to be successful. And how to be a light to this dark world. And what a great testimony. So people, that is... That's the gospel. Is it a perfect explanation? No, it's not perfect. Uh, and I've been trying to modify it over the years, adding some points that I need to add there. But I know one thing. The Father and the Son, they do communicate through the hypostatic union. And it's hard to comprehend. But they love you. And they love me. No matter what we've done in the past, no matter what we're going to do in the future, it doesn't make you sinless. It makes you forgiven for your sin. Substitutionary atonement. Somebody pays. It would be like getting pulled over by a police officer, right? Who, do, who likes that? I don't like that. I love police. They're great. And, and if, if I go to a stop sign and I get pulled over, I know I'm getting a ticket. But imagine someone else pulling up behind him and saying, Officer, I know this guy. Give the ticket to me. Let him go. You think you'll be happy that day? All of a sudden, you never even thought about these things. You just had a normal day. All of a sudden, when you realize something was given to you, you're very excited. You, you probably go to work. Guess what happened? I was driving on a road. I got pulled over. Some guy paid my ticket. He took my ticket for me. Wouldn't you be excited about that? I would. I, I'd probably tell that story for the rest of my life. Well, there's a greater story that we tell no one. We tell no one. And it is the story that's going to save them from something they have no idea. Because what is that prosecuting attorney constantly whispering in our ears? Just have a good time. Nothing to worry about. You're, you know what? They say the greatest lie Satan ever told is this. You're good enough. You're good enough just as you are. That's a lie. Because that means I would have to be as good as God. I'm not. I never, ever will be. No one will be. And the only way I'm going to stand in the presence of God is have the holiness of Jesus Christ. His holiness, like I am man's suit, gets put on me. And when I am in Christ, in that suit, I can do what I couldn't do before through Jesus Christ. So if you're here and you have never accepted this offer, because you can't say, well, when I die, I'll talk to God about it at the great white throne. No. Nope. You know what God says? If you don't make that decision now, there'll be a day at the great white throne when you will stand. And God is, God is a gentleman, as Pastor Timothy Gaines always says. He's a gentleman. And he will let you clear your case. And you'll say, well, God... Here's my life. Yep, did some fast stuff, but boy, you should have seen me on Christmas. Never missed a Christmas service. Helped a lot of people. I remember this one pretty girl broke down and I changed her tire. That has to account for something. And God will let you go on and on. And God said, God will say, that's wonderful. But he'll look in his book and he'll say, but there's a problem. I never knew you. You never knew me. Get behind me, you workers of iniquity. Those are the scariest words you will ever hear. I never knew you. God, no, me. I was at, do you know you could be at church, synagogue, mosque, every Sunday, Saturday, whatever, Friday, whatever you do, and God can say, I don't even know who you are because you never knew me. I offered you. Well, I want it now. Too late. I gave you your whole life from birth. To death, I've been waving. You know, guys, I talk about oh! racetrack, NASCAR stuff. You know, when we're born, we're given that green flag. You go. Run the race that is set before you. And all through our lives, God is, is, is waving that yellow flag, the caution flag. You got problems. You got to go into the pit. You got to get it fixed. Oh, I feel fine. No, you're not fine. You got a sin problem. 
get it fixed. God fixes it. You can't fix a sin problem. God will fix it by forgiving you for it and then help you to stop doing it. And then you know what happens? I was just at the racetrack last night working there. Okay? There's a flag for the last lap. Anybody know what that flag is? The white flag. That white flag gives me the chills. And I use it at every race car funeral that I do. That you don't know when God is waving the white flag, saying, you got one more lap, my child. One more lap, my friend. You got to heed the warning. Because you're either going to get the black flag and be thrown out, or what do we want to get? Check a flag. What does the Bible say? That everyone can win. There was, you know what? You know what the checkered flag is in heaven? Well done, good and faithful servant. And you know what they do at the racetrack? They did it last night. Every time a division wins, the winner takes the flag, the checkered flag. They give it to him. And he makes a victory lap around the track, driving with one hand and holding the flag. And the crowd goes wild. In heaven for you. That flag could be waiting, but it's your choice. Because you can't wave the victory flag if you didn't win the race. And how do you win the race? I have it on the back of our race car. Remember, we're the only church that I know of with a race car. And it says from Hebrews, run the race that is set before you, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. It's a race, people. You feel it? You're tired? And I think we're going to get into some heavy laps coming into October, November, December. Your wheels are going to start falling off. And God's going to be giving you caution flags saying, come on, get right now. Because be soon after that yellow flag is going to be the white flag. And you decide if you get the victory flag, the checkered flag. So that's the gospel. It's the good news. Why? I get what I didn't pay for. Don't you all love that? Don't you love when somebody comes to your house and says, Hey, I heard you owe $135,000 on your house. I got my checkbook here. Whoever uses checkbooks anymore. I'm going to pay your mortgage. Why? Because I like you. And I just want to do this for you. And what do you have to do? Accept it. That's it. Accept it. You know, the, the government always talks about the greatest bailout. The bailouts. Bail, you know, the greatest bailout in history? Jesus on the cross. The greatest bailout in all history. Everyone runs for the free bailout. Well, Jesus is offering this. Eternal life with him. Cost you nothing. Cost him everything. So few want it. The Bible says, narrow is the path that leads to destruction. No, excuse me. Broad is the path that leads to destruction. Narrow is the path that leads to righteousness. And few there be that find it. You know why few find it? Because there's so many other ways that sound so good. Well, I think this, and I think God is a leaf. I think God is a flower. I don't think God is anything. I think I make my own rules. Well, you better be a thousand percent sure. You know when you close your eyes in death. Because there is no turning back. And for the people who say, well, how do you know you're right? I always say, well, how do, know, how do you know that you're right? Because if I'm wrong, and I'm not, because God has told me so, what have I lost? If you're wrong, you have eternity. And all you have, can you imagine kicking yourself? I've made some bad mistakes that I've kicked myself. Can you imagine spending eternally, eternity separated from God, knowing all I had to do was say yes to Jesus? That was it? Yes, forgive me. Yes, that was it. That'll haunt you for the eons of time that never end. That never end. Please, call on the name of Jesus Christ today. It's very simple. Those who call on the name of Christ shall be saved. Everybody wants to add a lot of religion and stuff. No, yes, it's simple. But that's what God says. Trust Him. Believe Him. Call out to him. Understand you can't save yourself. I certainly can. I'm a wretched sinner who struggles with sin every single day. Thank God I'm forgiven. Thank God I'm forgiven. So that's the gospel message according to Pastor Scott. Hopefully it's according to Jesus Christ.
And what we're going to do now is we're going to head down to that water over there and we're going to have a baptism. And anyone here, and I don't care who you are, walking out in the side, playing basketball, whoever you are, can you imagine this? Can you imagine one day in eternity you stand before God and you argue? So I never knew. He goes, do you remember that day? When you're at the beach and that nutty guy was out there talking? That was your last message. That was, you have no excuse. I never knew. You have no excuse because when you left the beach was the day you died. That was your last chance. There was the white flag and you said, no, that's ridiculous. I will trust who? In who? Me? You? Who? Who are you going to trust? I'm a little nutty, sound a little passionate. You know why? Because people, don't you get excited when loved ones are getting taken away in an ambulance? Does that get you riled up? Gets me riled up. God cares. Body, soul, and spirit. So much so that he did what we can do. And he gave his son's life. You came down from his glory, became a man born to die on a cross 2023 years ago you know how i like to do that people it's the year 2023 why what happened 2023 years ago that's so insignificant well i think that's when jesus came so you mean time is divided by the entrance of christ into world into our world christ before bc and after this insignificant nobody is actually the divider of time and space. Yep, that's who he is. He is very important. And isn't it an irony that the only God we curse every day is the one who is God? The only one. You'll never hear another religious leader cursed but Jesus Christ the Lord. Why? Because the enemy knows how to pervert the truth and get you thinking about it so much that Jesus Christ just becomes a curse just another word and God says by your words you shall be justified and by your words you shall be condemned every idle word that a man shall speak he shall give an account for on the day of judgment thus saith the Lord wow you gotta watch what you say I gotta watch what I say because God is listening people you know what he wants to hear yes God yes save me save me and he will ready we're going to close with the song and then we're going to go down and we're going to do what's been done for thousands of years people as he did it in the bible okay let's join in this song